Good morning, and welcome to the Lutheran Church of Our Savior, Calgary. My name is Pastor Dave Saudi, and I'm very privileged, very grateful to be able to worship with you and bring you the word. Pastor Greg is away on holidays, and I got to see some of the pictures of his grandchild, and he's going to have a great time, and you're going to have lots to see when he comes back. I know it is still early, but I'm wondering how many of you are hungry right now. Maybe breakfast was a few hours ago, maybe there was no time for breakfast, but I'm going to mention food and draw attention to a grumbling, growling emptiness inside. We hunger. We hunger for a lot of things, things more than food. We eat when we are hungry, and we eat when we are not hungry, just tired, or bored, or restless. I want to tease you a little bit and make you restless for God. I want to tease you a little bit and remind you of your hunger, and remind you of all that God provides for you, for your hunger, your cravings, your emptiness. In our lessons today, the people are hungry and they come pursuing God because they expect God will feed them. God does. God offers bread for the belly and bread for the soul. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the bread from heaven. Because of Jesus, we need not hunger. But people are still hungry. More every day. It's not because God has not provided. People are hungry because we have not provided. It is, it is because of that need in others and that reluctance in ourselves that we need and seek God's forgiveness and change of heart. Would you pray with me? Holy God, as you have accompanied your people through times of captivity, wilderness, and exile, shelter and sustain all those who flee persecution, oppression, warfare, violence, hunger, and poverty. Open our hearts and homes, our gates and doors, so that they find safety, peace, and welcome, a place to live in freedom without fear. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our refuge and our hope. Amen. We continue with song. Continuing now with our readings, the first reading is from Exodus chapter 16, beginning at verse 2. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out here into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the, of the Lord appeared in a cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of the dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Here ends the first reading. Continuing with the gospel from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 24. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread, the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The whole congregation complained. The people were becoming a single people, a people with a single complaint. We're hungry. The people were discovering a new reality. They are not slaves anymore. They are not in Egypt anymore. They are in that liminal time, that time between time when, when they are no longer what they were and they're not yet what they will become. This is the wilderness and they are on the way to somewhere, but not sure how to get there. And the journey is certainly not the destination. The journey is long. The journey is hot, and the people are hungry. The people are learning something about themselves, and God, and life. And they are also forgetting. They had seen great power from God, power to deliver them through the messy miracle of ten plagues. They had seen the power of God divide the Red Sea so they could pass on dry ground, but their enemies would get stuck and drown. 
But that was six weeks ago already. Six weeks. A long time. And no time at all. Six weeks ago, they had refreshed themselves at the oasis at Elam, water and date trees. Hmm. But that was six weeks ago. Six weeks of sand and more sand. Who is this God that Moses and Aaron are following? Who is this God who beckons them on with promises, promises, promises? they would learn that this God has not abandoned them. This God is not up there among the stars beyond the heavens. This God is close enough to hear the children in their tents crying. This God is not like the Pharaoh enjoying luxury while the people suffer. This God is more like a shepherd in the desert, step by step, with them, beside the flock, day and night, more like themselves than royalty, familiar with the sand and the need for green pastures and still waters. This God provides, this God listens. The same God who heard the cries of the people in Egypt and responded with power and justice will respond again with power and justice mixed with a whole lot of compassion. God knows the needs, the wants, even the complaints of the people. Are we there yet? I'm hot. I'm thirsty. Ephraim and Michael won't stay on their side. I'm hungry. We've heard such whining before ourselves, haven't we? But rather than raising our voices like we might, and threatening to put the complainers on the side of the road like we might, God says, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have all the bread you want. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been hot. And we are trying to find our way in a wilderness for more than six weeks, 15 months, 16 months. And we've not arrived yet. We are hungry. And it will likely get worse before it gets better. The complainers say, I wish it could be like it used to be. We were better off back then. Before we lost our homes, our jobs, our health, our pensions, our dignity, our property, our savings. Oh, we are hungry and we are anxious and we are dislocated in space and time. But we will see the glory of God in daily bread and meat. We are learning, as the Hebrews were learning, that this wilderness is not God-forsaken. We are in this wilderness together, people say. Oh, there are times when those words are more irritating than comforting. The Hebrews are in a wilderness, and they will come to know God in this space that appears so empty. They will become the people of God in this space that certainly does not feel like home. These people will discover new ways of resilience, new ways of providing for themselves and for this long journey, no longer bound by the monotonous rigors of slavery. They are only bound by the limitations of their imagination. God will provide. At first, the people will not understand. Here is manna, but what is it? This is the bread the Lord has given you to eat, they are told. But what do we do with it? Dear friends in Christ, this old, old story is our story. God will not only provide the bread of heaven, Christ will also become the bread of heaven. God will feed us so we may feed others. 
Moses had a food system security problem. We also have a food system security problem. Let me tell you about some food security risks and why we should be concerned and involved. Now, before we go on, someone out there is going to say, but pastor, didn't Jesus say, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's true. Jesus did say that, and for good reason. Anxiety can be debilitating, and anxiety can cause division. At the same time, we are to be good stewards, seeing to the fact that justice is available for all, including food. Sometimes our concern is not for ourselves, but for our neighbor. Scripture also says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. How many times in how many places did Jesus see the people in need, whether sick, hungry, or anxious, and out of compassion, provided what was required? We have risks that threaten our global food supply system. The first one is centralization. Centralization. Twelve mega-mergers between 2015 and 2017 left seven multinational corporations. In 2017, seven multinational corporations controlled the production of seeds and pesticides worldwide. However, that number has been reduced now to four as three mergers since 2017 have consolidated more power in the hands of a few. Three of these corporations will control more than 60% of the seed and agrochemical markets, and almost all will use genetically modified plants. Consolidating power increases the dependency of the consumers. Corporations dictate the prices for seeds and pesticides to farmers. Genetic engineering is changing farming. So is digitalization. Agriculture increasingly depends upon computerized management systems. Small-scale farmers cannot afford this. Once wheat, maize, and soybeans are harvested, the ABCD traders come into play. Archer Daniels, Midlands, Bungie, Cargill, Dreyfus. Their combined share of the global market is 70%. The ABCD traders provide cheap commodities to the large food companies like Unilever, Nestle, Mars, Kellogg's, and Toshibo. These are the local suppliers of our supermarket chains. These are the gatekeepers who determine what items make it to their shelves, who produces what and how. Food producers pay to get their products onto the supermarket shelves, but that means farmers work harder for less money and smaller producers have limited access to the market. These supermarket chains that we all know are expanding fast, fastest in countries like India, Indonesia, and Nigeria, and this severely hurts the local traditional shops and markets. They're disappearing. Has productivity increased as industry claims? No. Millions of hectares of farmland are used for animal feed and biofuel. Monocultures, the intensification of single crops on large expanses of land, are destroying 24 billion tons of fertile soil each year. 
The reason 800 million people are malnourished is not because we lack food. It is poorly distributed. While many industries were hurting during the pandemic, the top 25 companies in this sector generated 800 815 billion in revenue in 2019, with profits increasing to 91 billion from 80 billion in 2020. Nestle, you know them for Hot Pockets, Stouffer's, and DiGiorno. With 30% of its sales in the U.S. added overtime shifts in the pandemic to 70 factories to meet increased demand. Nestle's profits neared 13 billion, an increase of 30% during the pandemic. Nestle has been the top food company for more than a decade, except in 2018 when Anheuser-Busch, InBev, surpassed them. In 2020, because of shuttered bars and stadiums, they ranked second again, followed by Pepsi in third place. Kraft Heinz surged to eighth spot for the food industry in 2020 as stay-at-home people moved to the center aisle of the supermarket looking for longer shelf life and stay-at-home convenience. This in spite of a $15 billion loss in its Kraft and Oscar Mayer brands. Now, please understand, my purpose in showing you these names and figures is to show that big names, familiar names, may undertake huge losses occasionally, but score huge profits nonetheless. Another risk, consolidation. Remember earlier in the pandemic when food proce processing plants closed because of high rates of infection among the workers? Because so much food processing is concentrated in so few plants, closing a center or two, or watching them close sequentially due to infection, severely affected the supply chain. So in some places, meat displays were limited. In all places, prices rose. And let's remember that these line workers bore the brunt of the risk of infection. And many of them were undocumented migrant workers with limited access to treatment or support for lost wages, which brings us to the vulnerable agricultural workers. Again, these workers were brought in from out of province, out of country. They counted on full shifts but needed to take time off for quarantine. They had limited access to health services. Language barriers made it difficult to understand their options. Housing provisions were often overcrowded with greater risk of infection. Globally, small-scale farm workers converted their farms to crops that would be sold on the global markets. They would grow our coffee and our cocoa rather than food for their own villages and families. The food they needed to eat themselves would be imported and sold to them and the farmers did not have the scale or the leverage to influence their own prices. These were set again by the multinationals. We don't yet know what the immediate effects or long-term effects of climate change will be. Severe drought, less snowpack, receding glaciers all mean less water for irrigation. Our crop management has engineered greater dependency on irrigation, and we are seeing the impact that several years of drought is having on California and the southwest United States. Lakes are disappearing. Subsurface aquifers are disappearing. Drought means, of course, not enough water, but then when rains do come, they are frequently driving torrential rains with flooding and erosion. Invasive insects are being found at higher elevations because of warming. Flowers blossom before the pollinators emerge. Early frost, late frost. Our canola is flowering weeks early, meaning there are no seeds to be harvested. Drying pastures mean paying for and transporting expensive feed for cattle, or else cutting production, raising costs. Lush farmlands are becoming deserts, not just in places like Africa, but right here. 
We are seeing erosion due to wind and water, our extensive and expensive use of pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers mean the biodiversity required at the root system is dying, and some plants and the resistance in some insects require even more synthetic intervention. Efficiency has meant greater concentration in poultry farming. You've seen the pictures. Hog production, the feedlot. It takes a lot of water and grain to produce the required 220 pounds of meat per person per year. You're never going to ask me back. This is getting depressing. <laughs> We don't think about these things as we carry in six bags of groceries from the car or when we enjoy burgers and sausages and vegetables and fruits grilled on the barbecue. So why are these concerns for faith communities? Well, we cannot simply blame food producers and distributors and packagers and marketers for our food supply chain, not for those risks. Those risks are all undertaken because of and on behalf of you and me, the consumers. We want food that is inexpensive, convenient, and available year-round. There was a day when living on the farm or in small towns, we had a greater interest in and awareness of the issues around food production. But now as urban dwellers, we are unaware. We are no longer a part of the producing chain. We are consumers. What is food? Food is a gift, a gift from God, and a gift of the labors of all those who handle our food from seed to harvest to flour mill to table. Food is marketed as a variety of commodities, but food is not a product designed for convenience, profitability, and market control. Food is an expression of love. Food is God's gift that is nutritious, delicious, and beautiful. Food is a way of sharing life. Remember in the wilderness story, the people were hungry and God provided. People wanted bread and meat and God provided. It was enough. It was not to be grabbed and hoarded. That wouldn't work. It spoiled. It was meant to be shared and enjoyed. And more would be given, enough would be given tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after. The goodness of the gift of food reflected the goodness of the giver. Food was a way of sharing love. Remember when you went to grandma's house and there was a whole table spread with treats and you had a full plate, you had two full plates, and grandma said, eat, eat. And you said, grandma, I can't, not another bite. Were you rejecting grandma's food? Or were you rejecting grandma's love? How do we receive our food when the land is degraded, the animals are stressed, and the workers are exploited? Could it be that God might be weeping because we are rejecting God's love? This must be a concern for faith communities, not just Christians, but all faith communities. This is a matter of care for creation and conservation, but it is also a matter of economic and social justice. The sustainability of our global food supply is a moral issue, a matter of justice, not merely marketing and economics. And our concern for food justice is more than charity. Bread lines and food banks and soup kitchens are not enough. Food charity is not enough. 
We need to be involved as consumers and as good neighbors in determining appropriate food policy. Policy decisions determine availability and distribution. Policy decisions determine whether we produce foods that keep people healthy or foods that make people sick. Policy decisions determine processing, packaging, and pricing. So I'm issuing you, this congregation, two challenges. There is this fall a United Nations Food Systems Summit. There was a pre-summit, July 26 to 28. Did you even notice? The fall summit, sometime in September or October, is emphasizing five action tracks to ensure access to safe and nutritious food for all to shift to sustainable consumption patterns, to boost nature-positive production, to advance equitable livelihoods, and to build resilience to vulnerable shocks and stress. So the first challenge is to prepare for the UN Food Systems Summit. Form a study group here. Access and follow the UN Food System Summit discussion guides. They're listed at the end of the sermon. They're, they were listed on your email invitation. The second challenge is to become aware of the impact of poverty in Canada, in Alberta, in Calgary. Become aware of your consumer choices and the impact they have on soil, water, livestock, livestock fish, and the fishers and the farmers behind them. Become aware that once more, it is the women of this world who are most often the farm workers, exploited and underpaid. We're hungry, the whole congregation said to Moses. One people with one complaint. Globally, we are one people, and the one complaint is getting louder. We're hungry. God does provide. There is enough food. The responsibility to distribute it belongs to us. Amen. Let us continue with song.
I invite you to continue our worship in prayer. This prayer is based on Psalm 78, verses 23 to 29. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever will be. In the wilderness your children complain, saying, We're hungry. Then you commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. You rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. It was such a divine experience, it seemed like mortals ate the bread of angels. You sent them food in abundance. You caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by your power you led out the south wind. You rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. You let meat fall within their camp all around their dwellings, and they ate and were well filled, for you gave them what they craved. As it was in the beginning is now. We are hungry, but not just for food. We claim we are starving for experience, for wealth, for opportunity, for security. We have food enough. Indeed, many of us are malnourished. Imagine that. We, with all our privilege, are malnourished. The numbers testify to this truth. Weight, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar. You provide what we need. It is our cravings that are out of hand. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever will be. There are millions who daily cry, we are hungry, and we sell them food, highly processed, with high sugar and high salt. That's where the profit is. And we package it, and we transport it, and we store it. The shelf life is forever. Our ancestors in the wilderness were not to gather their food and hoard it. It would spoil. But if they trusted that you would provide and if they shared what you had given them, there was enough and all were satisfied. Your son Jesus saw his people hungry. He had compassion on them and he asked his disciples to share what they had. It could not possibly be enough. But Jesus blessed it, and his disciples distributed it, and everyone ate all they could, all they wanted, and it was enough, more than enough. The poor and the hungry will always be with us, and the gifts of food you provide will always be with us. Give us hearts full of compassion. Give us hearts full of justice. Give us the desire to share so all may be fed, so all may have meaningful work and a fair wage, so all who are affected may share in the decisions that affect them. Then we will find peace, and we will leave the wilderness and find you have brought us home. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. As we close our worship, the blessing is on the screen. I'd ask that you respond with the words in dark type. I will say them with you. May we always be hungry for righteousness. 
to overcome injustices that bring about hunger. May we always be hungry for peace to overcome insecurity, suffering, and displacement. May we always be hungry to share our resources and blessings, to ensure that the needy in our communities are able to live full lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for this opportunity to worship. I hope that you'll take the two challenges. Right now we continue with our sending song.